the Christmas season is full of traditions, and many of those traditions really depend upon in what part of the world that you live, but some are quite common, and one whose history you might never have thought of is the history of Christmas cards. One of the earliest Christmas traditions, according to the Hallmark Company, Americans will send some 1.3 billion Christmas cards each year, sending pictures and holiday greetings and well wishes and life updates to faraway family and friends. But how Christmas cards became a part of the holiday season really depended upon developments in technology, in culture, in art, in the postal system, and on the Queen of England. It is holiday history that deserves to be remembered. In 1611, King James I of England received a letter from Michael Meyer, a German physician and counselor to the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II. Meyer had sent the card to King James and his son, Prince Henry. Discovered in 1979, the letters are the first we know that resemble modern Christmas cards. It contains the message, a greeting on the birthday of the sacred king to the most worshipful and energetic lord and most eminent James, king of Great Britain and Ireland and defender of the true faith, with a gesture of joyful celebration on the birthday of the Lord, in most joy and fortune, we enter to the new auspicious year, 1612. Take another two centuries for cards to appear in a mass market. Before 1400, woodcuts and other kinds of printmaking were well known around the world, but in Europe a lack of paper kept prints from being common. Beginning of the 15th century saw printing presses combined with newly founded European paper mills to make art prints widely available. This was remarkable. Before then, art in Europe was one of a kind, owned by churches and the elite. Lower classes immediately demanded devotional images and printing playing cards. But the proliferation of printed images didn't immediately lead to the creation of Christmas cards. One of the primary reasons was the issue of mail. Before the 19th century, postal systems were not really meant for the lower classes. They were not cheap, and they, or they simply didn't exist. As enterprising people began introducing the service more broadly, early nation states also began nationalizing the service and offering rates inexpensive enough to allow the poor echelons of society to actually use the service. Increasing literacy was also important. There was no point of sending a written message of basically any kind if the recipient couldn't read it. The final piece of the puzzle was the popularization, or perhaps repopularization, of Christmas as a holiday. Throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, various Christmas traditions were celebrated, but Christmas itself was generally a fairly rowdy public festival involving feasting and drinking. In England, Christmas was viewed especially poorly by the Puritans, who banned the holiday in 1647 after their victory in the English Civil War. It returned officially in 1660 with the return of the monarchy, but continued to have an iffy reputation publicly until the 19th century, when the Oxford movement of Anglican theologians argued, among other things, for a revival and increasing centrality of the keeping of Christmas itself as a Christian festival, and changing the way in which it is celebrated, emphasizing family, gift-giving, and reconciliation instead of the revelry it was associated with in some places. This began to catch on in England in the 1840s, especially when Charles Dickens, a vocal supporter of the Oxford movement, published A Christmas Carol in 1843. The story played a significant role in the meaning and celebration of modern Christmas. 1841 brought Queen Victoria's marriage to German Prince Albert, and with it the introduction of Christmas trees and German Christmas tradition to England, which would eventually lead to its adoption in the United States. The London Penny Post, a private business offering mail delivery in London for only a penny, began in 1680, but was seized by the Crown in 1683. Local Penny Post appeared in the 18th century, but it wasn't until 1840 that Sir Roland Hill, inventor of the self-adhesive postal stamp, was able to convince Parliament to implement a post office reform, which established the uniform Penny Post throughout the United Kingdom. Finally, there was the introduction of the card itself. Around 1840, Thomas Shorrock of Leith, Scotland, produced a number of cards with a jolly face and the message, A Good New Year to Ye. More often, Sir Henry Cole is credited as the inventor of the first commercial card. Cole was a civil servant and another supporter of postal reform. He was assistant to Roland Hill in the introduction of the Penny Post. By 1843, Cole's range of friends and acquaintances was large enough that instead of handwriting countless personal messages, he commissioned the design of a card from painter John Colcott Horsley. The card has a central scene of family drinking wine and two side panels containing images of charity with the message, A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you. Cole had a thousand copies printed so he could maintain decorum by answering his many contacts and sold the leftovers. It raised some controversy from temperance societies for its depiction of drinking, only a handful of copies have survived, and one sold for £22,500 at auction in 2001. From the 1840s, the Christmas card grew in popularity, with improvements in printing technology bringing down cost. By the 1850s, Queen Victoria was regularly sending out Christmas cards. 
the 1860s saw the first commercial cards. Messrs. Goodall and Sons produced embossed designs in 1862 and soon increased the number of designs available. By 1870, hundreds of European card manufacturers were printing Christmas cards. Marcus Ward and company made incredibly high quality cards beginning in 1867. And not just Christmas cards, cards in general grew in popularity along with them, with images of all kinds of things being produced. They celebrated any holiday with incongruous images of sports and landscapes. Many had flowers and scenes of spring and summer, partially because they were simply repurposed Valentine's cards, which became popular before Christmas cards did. Many people actually collected the odd cards or collected particular artists, and sending unique ones was highly prized. In a world that lacked screens, enjoying the art and saving it in an album was a popular pastime. Though we often criticize the consumerization of Christmas today, growing discretionary income brought consumerism to the forefront even in the 1840s, with ornaments, gifts, and indeed Christmas cards being some of the benefactors of the Christmas industry. In 1880 alone, 11.5 million cards were printed. Two years later, one firm paid at least 7,000 pounds to artists for original images, a truly princely sum in an era where few companies made that much in annual profit. In the U.S., the cards became truly popular when Louis Prang, a Prussian immigrant, began printing Christmas cards with his lithography business, first for sale in England in 1873 and then for the U.S. market in 1874. He has been called the father of the American Christmas card for his popularization of the Christmas greeting card in the U.S. By 1881, he was printing 5 million Christmas cards a year. The cards in the U.S. seemed to have become popular at a time when the family farm was dying and families began spreading out more and more, making the cards an excellent way to keep in touch. Some common images, such as pantalered young ones in snowstorms and angels floating in midair bearing a babe, were declared to contain no agreeable sensations as early as 1885. It was big business. By the 1920s, some 5,000 Americans were working at Christmas card factories, which were carefully curated from artists all over. In fact, those greeting cards provided a much-needed income for many struggling artists. In 1928, an editorial in the North American Review Literary Magazine complained about commercialization, writing that the card companies aim to make you think yourself a feverish yellow cur if you do not invest each December in $7 worth of assorted glue and ink and paper. It bemoaned consumers behaving like sheep and falling for it. Calvin Coolidge issued the first presidential Christmas message via newspaper. His successor, Herbert Hoover's wife, sent out 3,100 engraved note cards in 1929. The content of these greeting cards is often foreign to a modern audience. Partially this is because the established imagery of Christmas was not yet as firm as it is today, and partially it was due to differing tastes. In the Victorian era, the cards were seen as an art in and of themselves, and as collections grew, so did the demand that cards be unique. Samantha Bradbeer, archivist and historian for Hallmark, Inc., explains that by 1885, unique and even bizarre cards with silk fringe, glittered attachments, and mechanical movements were popular. Although Christmas cards usually had motifs related to flora and fauna, seasonal vignettes, and landscapes. Some seemed incredibly odd to the modern eye, such as a card with red and black ants fighting while carrying a banner that reads the compliments of the season. Anthropomorphized Christmas pudding, children, lobsters, bugs, fairies, and frogs were also commonly depicted. The cards of the 19th century were meant to be conversation pieces and oddities, not just festive seasonal greetings. Sentiments and designs that may seem unusual today were often considered signs of good fortune, while others poked fun at superstition, Bradbeer says. One of the more famous and odd is the depiction of dead birds. It was an incredibly common motif in Victorian Christmas cards, and the reasons for it are not entirely clear. One suggestion is that the dead birds, often in the snow, are meant to elicit Victorian sympathy and may reference common stories of poor children freezing to death at Christmas, explains writer John Grossman. Another suggestion connects to Wren Day, a historical Irish celebration held on December 26, which involves the hunting of a wren. These days, the celebration involves a fake wren, but it didn't always, and the celebration might reflect broader and similar celebrations across the ancient lands of the United Kingdom. Both the robin and the wren were considered sacred in various forms in Anglo and Irish folklore, and might have had some cultural connections that have simply been lost. Robins also appear carrying letters, because UK postmen of the time were red and were known as robins. Other seemingly inexplicable injuries include countless frogs, clowns, and terrifying human-animal or vegetable hybrids. More easily explained are images of the anti-Santa, Krampus, kidnapping or punishing children for bad behavior, as well as Santa himself shoving naughty children into bags. Of course, religious imagery abounded as well. Some of the things we traditionally associate with the season also appeared. Holly, for instance, first appears on a Christmas card in 1848. Washington Irving's The Old English Christmas, republished in 1876 with illustrations by Randolph Caldicott, helped entrench many of the motifs we now think of as traditional. Holly, mistletoe, Father Christmas, and the like. 
In England, by the 1890s, proliferation had led to a steady decrease in quality in most firms, and some happened in America slightly later. Louis Prang got out of the business in the 1890s as cheaper alternatives drove out his careful quality control. Postcards, which didn't require an envelope at all, were popular throughout the period, beginning in the 1890s. Two things made postcards boom in the U.S. Rural free delivery, universal in 1902, and the 1898 rate change that set postage rates for postcards at two cents. A golden age of postcards in the U.S. ran from about 1905 to 1915, when a billion cards were printed in the country each year. World War I saw demand for cards sent to soldiers at the front, and cards were often allowed to be printed even while paper was being conserved. After 1915, the telephone began to cut into the postcard business, with postcards dubbed the poor man's telephone. 1915 also saw the establishment of Hallmark, first of the Hall Brothers Company, which introduced the 4x6 folded cards that we know today. The card in its modern form, with many of the familiar designs of Santa, Christmas, and general Christmas joy. The 40s and 50s saw renewed popularity in cards like ones designed by Norman Rockwell. Today, the Christmas card industry remains alive and well, even despite the advent of e-cards and Facebook. In the United States, about 6.5 billion greeting cards are sent each year, with about 1.3 billion of those being Christmas cards. Meanwhile, in Europe, the Dutch Postal Service found that in 2012, 90% of Dutch households sent an average of 40 cards. Among 17 other European countries, between 68 and 76% of respondents planned on sending cards. Today, the ability to print almost anything cheaply has led to personalized cards, which pictures of families or pets or your home being quite common. And even if your cards don't necessarily get out on time, there's still a very good chance that you'll be either sending or at least receiving Christmas cards this year, if even only to say, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.